be blessed and all of his people. And everybody said, amen. God bless all of you. So happy to see you again. Last time we came together, hello, we were talking about resurrection morning. Amen. And the author had put together a string of scriptures. We looked at the resurrection. Now we're going to be looking at some of the benefits of the resurrection. Because Christ died and rose again on Calvary. Amen. We are no longer under the Mosaic law. We have a brand new covenant, brand new testament. Amen. And that's what our text is about. The glory of a new covenant. Amen. Now, unfortunately, some of our ancestors, amen, they had to live under the old, old covenant, the old testament. Amen. But when Christ died on Calvary's cross, the old covenant was done away with, and that's how we have the new covenant. We're no longer under the Mosaic law, but now take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Hello. Because the Ten Commandments were still, what? Taken over from the Old Testament even into our uh, 20th century society, the New Testament, with the exception of one, with the exception of one, and that's remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We don't honor the Sabbath today as they did back before Christ died on the cross. Now we honor Sunday, the first day of the week, because Jesus, what, rose on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. But Praise the Lord for the new covenant, and praise God for all of you. I thank you for your presence, all of you, the, uh, the posters, those that are here. A uh, number of things you could have been doing, but you took time out to learn and study of God's word, and God going to bless you real good. Amen. Thank Pastor Turner for giving us this time and space. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. We'll come back very, very, very exciting, challenging life of another day. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you for the New Testament, Lord. We praise you and thank you for the Old Testament as well, because both of them came from you, and they're both glorious, as we're going to see. And then, Heavenly Father, we praise you that you gave us the New Testament, which is permanent. And Lord, we won't be going back to the Old Testament, but it did serve its purposes. And we thank you for pulling back the curtain and allow us to see the purpose of the Old Testament. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we are here. And our lesson tech title being what? The glory of the new, the splendor, hello, the grandeur of the what? Of the new covenant versus the old covenant. The old covenant was good. Why? Because it came from God. It was glorious. Why? Because it came from God. And the new, pro the new covenant is good. Why? Because it came from God. And it's also full of glory, full of grandeur. And that's the covenant that you and I are living under. And we got the great apostle Paul. The greatest theologian of all time. Amen. And he shares with this New church in Corinth. Amen. And they were, they were, they were on the Apostle Paul saying, Oh, Paul, I don't know about your, your credentials. Uh, we don't know how you got to be an apostle. We know the other one, they're apostles, but we ain't sure how, how you got to be an apostle. And Paul says, Hey, the Lord called me to minister the New Testament. Now, these that were critiquing Paul, they were ministering the old Mosaic law. And said, the Lord called us, Paul, all of the disciples of his era, Peter, James, John, all the rest of them, God called us to what? Teach the New Testament. And so Paul starts off and tells them about some advantages 
of the new covenant versus the old covenant. And this is how he told them. Look at this. He starts off in chapter 3 here, and he tells them just what we talked about, that the Lord had called them to do the New Testament. And in verse 7, he says, but if the ministration, that meaning the covenant, the old covenant of death. Now, why did they call the old covenant the covenant of death? Hello. They call it the covenant of death because, number one, if you could keep the Old Testament, you could be saved. But you had to keep 613 laws, not counting all the ones that the rabbis and, and uh, the, of the day and the, and the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the ones that they added on to it. And they added on to the 613 laws. Hello? So you had to keep 613 laws plus the local laws. And they thought their authoritative commands were just as authoritative as the scripture itself. Hello. Now, it's a feat to be able to remember 613 different laws, not counting the local laws, and to be able to keep them all. And the sad commentary is, number one, nobody, nobody had the... Uh, had the uh, perfection to keep the old covenant. There was only one that ever kept it, and that was Jesus Christ himself. And he kept it perfectly, and he gave credit to you and I for keeping the Old Testament. Amen? But the thing of it is, nobody could satisfy the demands of the law. That's why they call it the covenant of death. You could, you could keep all of the laws for 50 years, perfect. And the law was a unit. And what do I mean by that? That means if you broke one, you broke them all. No matter how long you, you made perfection, before your life was over, if you messed up even in one point, you broke every one of the laws. And, and you couldn't get to heaven like that. Amen? Amen. So even though that was the law, nobody could, could actually have enough perfection to keep it and have a right relationship with God. Okay? Nobody. nobody. That's why they call it the law of death, because eventually, where? You were going to mess up. Hello. Hello. That's why they call it the law of death. It says it was written and engraved in stones. And who wrote it? God himself wrote it. Wrote it with his finger. Hello. On tablets of stone. Now, the stone stands for rigid. No movement. You couldn't mess up here. Not to the left. Not to the right. No up. No down. Straight down the middle. If you didn't, you broke one, you broke them all. And what did Moses do with the stone? He went down the mountain, and the people were doing what? They were worshiping the golden calf. <laughs> Hello. Moses got upset, dropped the tablets, and broke them. What was that symbolic of? Even though God gave them this new covenant, they were going to do what? All they were going to do was break it. Break it. That's why they call it the covenant of what? Death. Amen. They, they, all they did was broke the covenant. They didn't keep it. Nobody could keep it. Hello. Until Christ came along. Now, when Moses came down, look what it says. It says, in stone was glorious. Now, when Moses came down the mountain, what was his face? His face shined just like the sun. That was the glory of the new covenant. I mean, excuse me, the old covenant and the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments uh, in particular, but it stood for the whole Mosaic law system. Amen. And everybody saw Moses' face, and they were just dazzled to see his face uh, radiate 
with the reflection of the glory of God. It wasn't, it wasn't Moses' glory. It was really God's glory. And Moses had been in God's presence for so long, what? Moses had took on this radiant, uh, shining, just like the brightness of the sun. Amen. And this is Paul's interpretation of Exodus 34, verses 29 through 35. So if you read that, it'll tell you how Moses came down and his face was radiant and everything, and the people were afraid of him. They didn't. That was the glory that came with the Old Testament. Amen. The Old Testament, the old Moses, it was glorious. Why? Because it came from God. Amen. And uh, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses because it shined so brilliantly, uh, which glory was to be done away. Now, that gives us one takeaway from this whole Mosaic system. They said it was glorious. Oh, yes, it was glorious because God gave it. Moses' face shined like the sun, and everybody was, was just dazzled with it and, and everything. But they said right from the very, very start, the glory was to be done away. The takeaway was the fact that the law was what? Temporary. It, the law didn't last for a long period of time. Uh, and we know that. But they were under the law for a number of time, a number of, uh, not sure exactly the years, but for, for a period of time they were under the law. And the law served a very, very unique purpose. It revealed what sin was. And God never intended for the law to save them. And he never intended for the law to be permanent. Did the people understand that? They didn't understand that. <laughs> they didn't understand it. So Paul wants to explain it to them. So that's what he's doing now. He says it started off with a bang. Hello. Look what he says here. But one one drawback, it was only temporary. Verse 8, how shall not the ministration, how shall not the covenant of the Spirit be rather glorious, even what? More glorious. Now, God was going to bring in a new covenant. And he had already said that way back in Jeremiah 31, 31. God knew all the time this was just temporary. Amen. Jeremiah 31, 31, it tells you what? God had already declared that, number one, behold, the day coming, what? That there will be a new covenant with Israel. He said not only a new covenant in verse 30, 31, 34, Jeremiah, he said what? Not only, I'm going to do what? Forgiveness for all of you will be for what? Everybody. Now, did the old covenant have any room for forgiveness? No. no. It was made out of stone, rigid, concrete, art. No room for forgiveness whatsoever. It identified sin, but it did not help you get out of your situation if you broke the law. Hello? No provision of relief whatsoever. Now, verse 8 gives us a hint. He says, now, uh, how shall not the ministration of the what? The Spirit. Now, when the new covenant came in, what also was ushered in with that? The Holy Spirit. Amen. And Christ told him, he says, if I go not away, what? The Spirit will not come. They call the Spirit, the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, we call it the paraclete or paracletine. Amen. What? The Spirit that what? goes along beside us and helps us in our what? Everyday Christian living. That's the Spirit of God. We call it the Holy Spirit. And when God sent the Holy Spirit, 
The Holy Spirit's been here ever since. You can't find it in the, in the Bible anywhere that once the Holy Ghost came, the Holy Ghost went back to heaven. No, nope, you can't find it. It's not in there. Holy Ghost still here. When Christ left, the Holy Ghost came, been here ever since. That's what he's talking about here, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, he said the Spirit came to give us relief and to give us help. Now, in the Old Testament, the Spirit was on people for different occasions. But in the New Testament, the Spirit is with us, what? All the time to convict us of our sins and help us, what? To do better. Hello. Aren't you glad we're under the New Testament? Amen. I know you all. I am. Amen. Don't down. He says, okay, number one, the law was temporary. And the new law that was coming, the new covenant, it had the spirit to help you as opposed to the Old Testament, which did not. Verse 9, for it's the ministration, for it's the covenant of condemnation. Now, they, covered it, they call it the covenant of, uh, the covenant of death. They also covered it, call it the covenant of condemning. Why did the Old Testament condemn you? Amen. It pointed out sin, but it didn't help you at all. Amen. It was, it's like a mirror. You can look in a mirror and see the imperfection. But the mirror won't help you straighten out the imperfection. That's the way the law was. It only identified and revealed sin. But it could not help you get out of your situation. Amen. The mirror can't help you. It'll just show you what's wrong with your cosmetics or whatever you're looking in there, how to beautify yourself and put on your makeup, whatever you want to do. But the mirror won't help clear up any other perfections whatsoever. Hello. It just gives you a picture of what's wrong. And that's it. Now, now, he proceeds on and he goes to verse 9. Verse 7 says, there's one takeaway, it's only temporary. Another takeaway in verse 9, for if the ministration of the condemnation, and they call it the, the spirit, uh, covenant of condemnation, be glorious, he says, how much more is the new covenant which helps bring about righteousness? Now, amen, the Holy Spirit helps in a number of ways. And if you did mess up, what? Because there was forgiveness, God would forgive you for your sins under the new covenant, and give you another chance, another chance to start what? All over again. Amen. Amen. And assuming uh, that you paid attention to the Holy Ghost and the leading of the Holy Ghost, convicted you of your sins, what? You repent of your sins and what? You move forward. He gives you another chance. He gives righteousness. He gives you another chance to get the situation right. Amen? Amen. Amen. He says, the, the, the new covenant helps promote righteousness because it's not so stringent that if you make a mistake or error, you can't be restored. So you can be restored under the new chance, new, new covenant. And many of us have messed up how many times? At least one. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> At least one. All of us have. And some of us mess up more than that. Hello. 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 But anyway, the Lord made room for forgiveness. Amen. Under the new covenant. And this one can cause you to have a right relationship with God because it gives you what? Another chance, amen, to get it right. Verse 10, for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect. Now, the Old Testament came in with a bang. Glory, Moses, face shining, coming on a mountain, 
uh, people just looking on Moses and everything that God told Moses, Moses would tell the people. And so they had direct communication with God. Amen. He said, and even though that was glorious, he says, in comparison, that said, uh, had no glory in this respect. Verse 10, he said, when you compare it, the old covenant with the new covenant, really, uh, in, when you compare both of them, the old one is not even be compared with the new one. Amen. Amen. That's what Paul said. It seems like it, it started off with a bang, but, but when you really look at the, the, the facts between one versus the other one, there's really not much of a comparison. The, 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 the new covenant far excels, far exceeds, far surpasses what? The Old Testament. Forgiveness can take you a long way. Hello? But a huge price had to be paid. Jesus had to die for that and pay the penalty for sin, past, present, and future for us to get this new covenant. And that's what Paul wants us to understand. It didn't cost us much, but it cost Christ a whole lot. He had to suffer, bleed, and die for this new covenant. That's why he said, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Hello. He had to shed his blood to get this new covenant. That's why Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And he had to pay a tremendous price for that. Don't forget, and don't take the, old, the, the new covenant lightly. Because a huge price had to be paid for that. Amen? Amen. But it's what? Far exceeds the old one that we have. No, no, no. He says, verse 10, for even that which was made glorious had no glory at all. When you really compare it by reason of the glory of what? Excellence. When you compare it to what Christ did on our behalf. He says, the old covenant was good, but what? Don't compare with the new. But it was a horrible price. Jesus came, and he lived the what? The Old Testament perfectly. And we got credit, but he had to die for it. Hello. Imputed righteousness. That's what we got. We did the crime, and he did the time. The punishment, the agony, the pain, the suffering, the death for this new covenant that we got. But it goes on, verse 11, for that which was done away. Now the Old Testament came right on in and, and it started off real good, but it what? It faded away. It faded, it faded out. It faded out. We, we're not up under that no more. And it says it faded away, says, but it was glorious. It was glorious. He said that even if that was glorious and the mediator was Moses, how much more greater is this new one? And the mediator is who? Jesus Christ himself, the son of the living. He's the mediator of the new covenant that we have today, even though it includes what? the Mosaic Law, and what? The Ten Commandments as well. And we talked about them. All of them apply even in the New Testament with the exception of one, and that's the Sabbath day, and we talked about that already. Amen. But that's the new covenant that we have. And it says here, it says, more which remaineth is glorious. Now he said the one that remains is more glorious. Now, the old one was temporary. The new covenant is what? Permanent. 
It, it stands all the way into the future. Amen. All the way unto what? The end of time. It'll never be renewed. It'll never be uh, surpassed by anyone or anything. This new covenant is here to stay. Amen. And we're not being ratified by the blood of goats and bulls and rams and other animals. Jesus Christ's blood himself. Hello. Ratified the new covenant. The blood of God himself. It ratified the new covenant. That's why it surpasses everything. Nothing to be compared with it. And back in the day when they offered the animal sacrifices, guess what? They weren't sure uh, if their sins were forgiven or not because they were going to the Holy of Holies and offer the sacrifice. They would tie a rope around the priest. And if the Lord struck him dead while he was in there, they they pull him out with that rope. But because this one was ratified by the blood of Jesus, never to be redone again, never to be repassed. This, this one far exhales all of the rest. None can compare with it. All the way into eternal state. That's how far it extends to. Now, we go to verse 12. But don't forget, one was temporary, one didn't give any assistance. Amen. One ushered in righteousness, and then one was what? Permanent. And that's the one that we have here now, the one that's permanent. Now, in between verse 11 and verse 12, Paul answers the question. Hello? He answers the question. You got to catch that one between 11 and 12. He answers the question. And they said, if the ministry of the Spirit under the new covenant bring life, and not death, why are the majority of the Jews and the people in Paul's day still rejecting it? So Paul decides to answer that question. So he starts answering that question in verse 12. Amen. So here we go, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope. Now that was... Uh, confident expectation. They were expecting the best. And Paul said, we. He was talking about himself. He was talking about the prophets. He was talking about the preachers and, and the apostles and all that were teaching what? The New Testament. We got, look what he said, we got. We use great plainness of speech. In other words, we preach boldly. We Preach and teach like we done lost our minds. We're fearless. We're courageous. Hello. And not only are we fearless and courageous, we speak without hesitation. Why was Paul and them so sure now? Why? Because Christ, the Son of God, had shedded his blood. It wasn't like the bloods of goats and bulls and animals that had to have the what? Had to have the, the sacrifices once every year. And, and you wasn't sure if your sins were forgiven. But when Christ died once and for all, they knew that their sins were forgiven and there was no reservations or hesitations about it. And so Paul says, we're going to preach and teach with great boldness that you guys don't even preach with. Why? Because you don't have the assurance that Christ's blood covers sin past, present. Past and present. Amen. And even in the future. Hello. Amen. Now, he's answering the question here now. He's answering the question why so many people had rejected it. So look what Paul said. Look what, he goes right back where he started at. Verse 13. And not as Moses. Now, when Moses came down, he had a veil over his face. Come down from the mountain. 
He said, we don't do it like that. He said, he said what, uh, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look or gaze uh, to the end of that which was abolished. Now, Moses didn't allow them to see that this reflected glory uh, was fading away and it was going to be temporary. He put a veil so they could see. And plus they were afraid to look on him anyway. Amen. Because they never seen a person's face shine like that. Amen. That was a dazzle uh, that was brought in and ushered in the Old, Old Testament uh, laws. Amen. And they said, even though it was doomed to disappear, Moses didn't allow them to see that. Amen. He covered his face with the veil. Amen. He says, he says, but that etched in their mind, uh, it never, it never went away. Look how he says it. He says, but their minds were what? Blinded. They had become hard hearted uh, because they remember that with Moses and his face, how it shone. He says, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament and then it says which veil is done away in Christ. Now he says these people had a mental block, mental blindness, hardness of heart because of how Moses came in with the Old Testament and it did something to them. Amen. They became hard-hearted and rigid, amen, etched in their mind, didn't want to change, amen. But then he goes on and say, in the last part, he says here, which veil is done away when Christ died. Did they want to accept that? Nope. <laughs> they didn't want to accept that. They didn't want to hear nothing about faith and coming to Christ. And Paul was preaching faith. Ain't want to hear it. Hello. They rejected what Paul said because Paul wasn't what? Going with the old Mosaic system. And he said, it's going to be etched in their heart. Covered up. Look what it says. The same veil untaken away in the reading of the what? Old Testament. They, they didn't want to hear anything about this faith stuff that they had to turn to Christ. They didn't want to hear it. And Paul was saying, as long as you got that attitude, what? And don't come to Christ in faith, that veil will always be on your heart. You'll always be hard-hearted. Amen? Now look how he says it. He just elaborates on it here in the next couple of verses. He says, but even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. That's the veil is a covering. Amen. But it was spiritual. Amen. It was spiritual. Amen. Listen at this. Moses wore a physical veil over his face. The veil is removed spiritually because of Christ's death on the cross. It's, it's not there anymore. But in their mind, spiritually, it's there. But look what happened. However, each mind remains blind. Each heart remains blinded, unable to understand and believe the gospel until a person turn to Christ in faith. Hello? Hello? They didn't want to turn the corner. They didn't want to let go of the old system. Amen. They didn't want to go the new way of faith in Christ Jesus. That's the covenant that you and I are under. We believe. We don't have to follow 613 different laws to try to get faith say, and if we miss one, we break them all, because the law was a unit, one unit, 
that meant that if we broke one, all of them are broke. Aren't you glad we're under the new covenant? All you got to do now to have a right relationship with God is what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, believe in thy heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, thou shalt, hello, be saved. So a lot of people hung up today. Oh, I don't believe it's that easy. It can't be that easy. All the stuff I done did and, 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 and all I got. Oh, man, I don't. What? They're afraid to step out in faith and believe on Jesus Christ. The new covenant made it easy. And he made it so easy, some of them don't even want to accept it. Hello? Hello? Don't be like that. Amen. Believe what God said. The Old Testament was not a mistake. It had its purpose. It identified sin and let you know what sin was. Amen. But it had no provisions to forgive you for your sin. The New Testament, what? God's grace will what? Forgive you and allow you to what? Move forward. Amen. In a new relationship. You get a second chance. Another chance. Amen. And then he says, uh, nevertheless, when you shall turn to the Lord, that means in faith. The veil shall be what? Taken away. That's verse 16. Okay, now, 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 we're almost out of here. Verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit. Now, when he said that, he's not trying to say the Lord and, and the Holy Ghost are the same one. But Paul was thinking about oneness. Oneness, Father, Son, and Lord. That was three distinct beings in one divine essence. Amen. But, but, but Paul corrects it in the next part of that same verse, 17. Look what he says. First time he said it, now the Lord is that spirit. It makes it sound like Christ and the spirit are the same, same, same thing. No, no, no. He corrects it in the last half. Look what he says. And where the spirit, now this time he said the spirit of what? The spirit of the Lord. Amen. Now he's talking about the Holy Ghost, and we know it. Amen. Amen. Paul is very, very decisive, and he covers one point, oneness, and at the same time he comes back and he distinguishes between Christ and the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's in verse 16 here, and uh, that was a what? Uh, reliteration of Exodus 34, 34, as Moses was able to go before the Lord. When Moses went back and talked to the Lord, if you look in verse 34, 34 of Exodus, when Moses went and talked to God, he, put, he took the veil off. Amen. When he went back out and talked to the people, what did he do? He put the veil back on. Amen. And that's a word picture. Amen. That coming into the presence of the Lord. Amen. That you can be like Moses was physically, uh, but now you have to do it in a spiritual way. You have to exercise faith in God as opposed to to the physical part, uh, physical part of him uh, physically putting on the mask. And today, and under the New Testament, spiritually, the, the mask is already, veil is already removed, but you got to exercise faith. Amen. Please understand, I had said that, uh, I know I'm being redundant about it, but the Bible is redundant in a lot of places, so that's why I had to say it more than once. Amen. So, but now here, he says, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. What do you have in the New Testament? Freedom from condemnation. Hello? Freedom from what? Guilt. Freedom from what? Sin. Because God what? Forgives you. Freedom from what? Spiritual death. Amen. And freedom from what? The old covenant. 
Now that list not made to be exhausted. That's, that's not all only thing we have under the new covenant. We have all of that. Freedom from condemnation, guilt, sin, death, and the old covenant. And look what else he says now. We're on the last verse. We're on the last verse. But we all, now Paul was talking about who? Himself, the prophets, uh, uh, the, the apostles, the preachers, and believers as well. All of them that what? Under the New Testament covenant. Look what he says. With open faces. That means without the veil. We don't have the veil on now. Amen. Without the veil, beholding. Now, beholding means looking. Looking as in a glass. Now, what's the glass he's talking about? He's talking about a mirror. Now, back in the old day, they didn't have mirrors like we got today. They had a piece of metal, and they shine it up. Keep on, and they didn't have wax and stuff like we got today. And, and, and you could see in it your image, but you couldn't see like you see in a mirror like we have today. But that's what they used for a mirror. It was a piece of metal all shined and buffed up. Amen. And that was the best they had. He says, it's just like looking at God's glory, the way that Moses looked at it. Amen. He says, we have to do that under the new covenant. We can look at the glory of the Lord, and we are what? Changed into the image of God. And God is wanting us to be like who? Like him. He wants us to be Christ-like. You know what they call that in the Bible? Sanctification. First, he justifies us and calls us uh, righteous, declares us righteous, rather. And then sanctification is an ongoing process where we continually grow spiritually into the image of Christ Jesus. God wants us to be, all of us to be just like his son. Amen. Christ Jesus. That's what he wants to transform us into the image of his dear son. Okay, so to change us into the same image from what? Glory to glory. From what? From one degree of glory to a what? Another degree. Constantly growing spiritually and we become more and more like Christ. That's the New Testament way. Justification, sanctification, from one highlight to another highlight. Grow spiritually. Amen. And even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, we not only have teachers like myself, uh, great pastors like Pastor Turner and uh, a lot of other the ministers of the gospel, but look, not only do we have them to teach, we got the Apostle Paul teaching and all of the Bible, but we also have the Holy Ghost that comes in and helps us to lead a Christian life. Amen? That's the new covenant that Paul is talking. It's superior to what? The old covenant that we initially had, uh, that even our forefathers had to live under for a period of time. Amen. Aren't you glad you're under the new covenant? Amen. Make sure you enjoy the teaching of those around you that you're with, the pastors, preachers, teachers, prophets, all of those that teach the gospel and the word of God, and make sure you what? Tune your ear into the Holy Ghost as well. Amen. That's the new covenant and all that it offers. Amen. Praise God. Thank God for this message. The new covenant, superior to the old. The old covenant was not a mistake. It had its purpose. Amen. But the new covenant will never be exceeded, no matter how much time moves forward. In Jesus' name. Let us look to the Lord. Until next time, Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the new covenant that you ushered in. Moses was the old covenant agent, but Jesus Christ was the new covenant agent. And Lord, his covenant, the New Testament, the new covenant will never, ever be phased out 
like the old was. And it wasn't a mistake, the old covenant. It was the way you had it planned. Help us that we'll gravitate to the new covenant and forgive this if we haven't already did it. In Jesus' name, amen. That was that was Wes's minute. He let me out of it. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you. I appreciate you.